Passover week, I'm leapfrogging over the next two sections and jumping right into the third passion prediction. And, and actually, we're going to cover all three to get a bigger picture. Of course, you know, each one of the passion predictions is made by Yeshua, or you may call him Jesus, um, and it's made, quote unquote, on the way, which takes us back to Isaiah 42, and is followed by the disciples, you know, specifically one or more of the three, not getting it, and to some extent or another, giving us a real hard lesson in the difference between the politics of the kingdom of God and the kingdoms of the beast. And why do I say kingdoms of the beast, quote unquote, instead of kingdom singular as with the kingdom of God? Well, because frankly, the kingdoms of the beast are divided and the kingdom of God is one as he is one. It is only as we are still collaborators with the beast kingdoms that the kingdom of God seems divided. But that's really just evidence that our feet are not firmly planted in his worldwide body. Um, you know, that we see and even desire divisions. And, you know, hey, I'm not immune to that, but God's working it out of me more and more. And I ought to tell you about a book that I just finished. It's written by Professor Michael L. Battle. And it is called Heaven on Earth. Uh, I think it's, uh, sub I don't have it in the room with me. I just finished it last night. It's called um, God's Call to Community in the Book of Revelation. And it is life-changing. Highly recommend it. Uh, anyway, let's, uh, let's read the three passion predictions from Mark before moving on into the rest. Start with chapter 8, verse 31. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. Chapter 9, verse 30. And they went on from there and passed through Galilee. And he did not want anyone to know. For he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men and they will kill him. And when he's killed, after three days he will rise. Chapter 10, starting in verse 32. And they were on the road, going to Jerus up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. And they were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. And taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was to happen to him, saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles, and they will mock him, and spit on him, and flog him, and kill him, and after three days, he will rise. All right. Hi, I am Tyler Don Rosenquist, and welcome to Character in Context, where I teach the historical and ancient sociological context of Scripture with an eye to developing the character of our Messiah, if you prefer written material, I have five years worth of blog at theancientbridge.com, as well as my six books available on Amazon, including a four-volume curriculum series dedicated to teaching scriptural context in a way that even kids can understand it called Context for Kids. And I have two video channels on YouTube with free Bible teachings for both adults and kids. You can find the link for those on my website. Past broadcasts of this program can be found at characterincontext.podbean.com and transcripts can be had for most broadcasts at theancientbridge.com. If you have kids, I also have a weekly broadcast where I teach them Bible context in a way that teaches them why they can trust God and how he wants them to have a relationship through the Messiah, and that's called Context for Kids also. Uh, all scripture this week, as usual, comes courtesy of the ESV. English Standard Version, but you can follow along with whatever Bible you want. A list of my resources can be found attached to the transcript for part two of this series at theancientbridge.com. And I'm going to apologize ahead of time. My sinuses are going nuts this morning. I've already been shoveling snow. Not as much as yesterday, though. And the day before that, I had to actually had to get the plow out and <laughs> And <laughs> we have this dangerous intersection in front of our house. We live at the end of a T, right off the main drag. And so, you know, we get a lot of people coming in, making a turn. And sometimes the turn doesn't exactly end up in the road. 
so I have to plow to keep people from dying <laughs> or crashing into mail my, my mailbox or our cars or, or or whatever, but mostly dying. So anyway, blessed Passover week, everyone. You know, it's strange this year having the beginning of the Passover at the end of the Sabbath. So that's going to take some significant planning on my part. Uh, my son, Matthew, will is uh, going to be on spring break from college. Although, you know, he does live at home, so it's not really like, you know, it's like, oh, he's home. He's always home. He uh, he works and and goes to college online. He uh, He's getting his criminal justice degree and criminology degree, crim criminal justice and criminology degree from Missouri, Missouri State Online. He and Andrew will have turned 20 years old on Monday, long after I record this. And I hope that went well as I'm recording in February. It's nice having grown up sons. <laughs> Andrew works at Sam's Club. And so I rarely have to go there anymore. I just ask him to shop for me before he goes home. Life is good, and Andrew's gone all this time since his three surgeries in the fall, two neurosurgeries, and one surgery on his lungs. You know, now without a hitch for three months, he feels great, and I don't think about it constantly anymore. He really likes his new job. Mark and I will be celebrating 30 years of marriage in three weeks, and so I'm taking him hiking in Tennessee to the Great Smoky Mountain National Park, where neither of us have been. We'll be a week in Gatlinburg, and if anyone knows a great restaurant there for the big day, I'd love to hear it. You know, you always just get a vacation rental and we cook for ourselves, but we can splurge for the actual anniversary. So, we have a lot to celebrate um, this Passover on the home front, but even with all our blessings, they, they pale in comparison, all right, to what our Messiah accomplished on behalf of the world on that day, on that Passover. Now, on my last Passover program, I focused on the horrors of crucifixion. Um, but we can never forget that he is victorious now and seated at the right hand of the Father. He is no longer in pain. He is no longer humiliated. He won. It was evil and horrifying, but he has the victory. You know, we can't forget the cross, but we also cannot afford to forget the victory. So let's get to it. Now, the passion predictions were a terrible shock to the disciples. Once Peter correctly identified Yeshua as the Messiah, the gloves had to come away. You know, uh, you know, gloves had to come off, the veil has to come off. They had to understand exactly what the word Messiah means because, like the word gay, it had come to take on a lot of meanings that were not in line with God's actual plans. We see in part, right? And we generally choose the parts of that that appeal to us. It's like we we ignore the confusing scriptures that that we don't like. It's um, why um, no script, prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation, and nobody ever knows what's going to happen until afterward. Um, and we see this uh, with the book of Revelation, where our current understandings of how the book originally read are now warped by futuristic dispensationalism focused on violence when Yeshua is portrayed everywhere as the lamb who conquers through his testimony, the sword of his mouth and his own blood. And because we don't know how to read it, we read um, things back into some parts of the gospel that aren't actually there. But, you know, I'll cover Revelation after we cover Matthew so in a few years. <laughs> I'm already studying for it, though, since my studying for Matthew's already done. Anyway, we need the teachings in both Mark and Matthew so that Revelation will make more sense. But and as I was saying, the word Messiah was full of hopes and dreams for the violent conquest of their enemies. They wanted revenge. Yeshua had to speak clearly and tell them that there would be no revenge against the worldly authorities, but it would be against the demonic authorities behind them, who had all mankind held captive to sin and death. Yeshua was going after the real enemy. It would be like our going after gang members and expecting that to solve the problem while ignoring fatherlessness, poverty, racism, and the inherent hatred between groups. 
you know, Yeshua would tell us that what they need is deliverance from the beast system, whereas we want to punish their way out of it, which, of course, doesn't usually work, okay? It almost never works. Yeshua came to destroy the root of the problem. He came to save people. He came to save the vulnerable and their oppressors. But that isn't anything that the first century Jews want. Heck, you know, looking at social media, that isn't what believers want either. When I see people who hate abortion saying, well, at least the babies who are being aborted would probably be Democrats, so it isn't all a lost. It's not any different than what the disciples were saying here. When we want to see our enemies burning in hell instead of coming to faith, that's no different than the false messianic expectations of the first century. Yeshua came to save. Each person unsaved is a net loss for the kingdom and a net gain for the beast system. We shouldn't want the beast system to win just so that we can get revenge. We should be so focused on looting the beast kingdom, you know, not wishing people into it. And so um, Yeshua's been, all this time, leading his blind disciples on the way, quote-unquote, on the way they have not known or suspected. Let's take a look at Isaiah 42, verses 16, 18, and 19. And I will lead the blind in a way that they do not know. In paths they have not known, I will guide them. I will turn the darkness before them into light, the rough places into level ground. These are the things I do, and I do not forsake them. Hear you, deaf, and look, you blind, that you may see. Who is blind but my servant? Or deaf is my messenger whom I send? Who is blind as my dedicated one? Or blind is the servant of the Lord? Now here Yahweh is saying that he himself would lead the blind in a way they do not know. And we've been seeing these references to Mark, references um, since Mark 8 to Yeshua and the disciples being on the way or on the road or on a journey. And the word for that is hodos. And it is the same as here in Isaiah 42, 16 in the Septuagint which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures, long before Yeshua was, was born. Mark is continually revealing Yeshua to be the Yahweh warrior of the prophets, the arm of the Lord in Isaiah, and the servant of the Isaiah's servant songs. That's one of the reasons why we see things like the two-part healing of blindness in Bethsaida. And we see the healing of the blind man coming up in a few weeks after James and John respond to this latest passion prediction with a shameful request to be the top two, to the two top men in the kingdom of God. You know, behind Yeshua, of course. Now, before the first passion prediction, we will review, you know, which we will re review in just a moment. They were totally blind as to the way on which they were being led. Even after the rude shock of the first announcement, they remain blind as to the nature of the kingdom of heaven. And they keep making requests, reeling just how clueless they are. So let's take a look at the three predictions and how they develop and what they increasingly reveal about the fate of the Messiah. Back to chapter 8. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. Um, the phrase, and he began to teach them, is a common expression for, in Mark for Yeshua branching out into new material. Although Peter called him the Messiah properly, Yeshua still refers to himself as the Son of Man, and I believe it was to distance himself from the Second Temple era messianic expectation baggage. Now, what does he specifically introduce to them? One, suffering is his immediate future, not glory and victory. Two, he will be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and scribes, not anointed as king by them. That's why those three groups were, were mentioned. They, they are the ones who would have been responsible for that in ancient Israel. Three, he would actually be killed. 
formally ending their messianic hopes, and four, after three days, he would rise again. Now, of course, as you recall, they flipped out, and Peter actually rebuked him, which is a huge cultural no-no. No student rebuked their teacher or embarrassed them in any way, on purpose, ever. This was beyond unthinkable. But I think that after they heard Yeshua announce his actual death, that after that they just didn't hear anything else. This prediction was specifically aimed at the fact that they had all just realized they were following the Messiah. They were the inner circle and were all expecting not only a triumphant entry into Jerusalem, but a war to rout and destroy the Romans and to return what the kingdom had been like under the leadership of David and the early days of Solomon. That had to be crushed immediately. Yeshua specifically warns them that if their goal is to live, then they will lose their lives. But if they are willing to lose his lives for their sake, they will save it. Now, such is the upside-down world of the kingdom of heaven compared to the ways of the beast kingdom. There is also a mini-prediction spoken just to Peter, James, and John after the transfiguration in chapter 9. This is um, starting in verse 9, too. And as they were coming down from the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead might mean. So despite Yeshua cl speaking clearly the first time, they are really confused about the idea of rising from the dead. Now, as Typical first century Jews, they firmly believed in the resurrection from the dead. And as far as I know, only the Sadducees didn't believe that. But they had expectations that everyone would raise up in order of precedence, starting with Abraham at the ushering in of the world to come. So the natural question would be, are we that close to the end of the age and the resurrection of the dead? Well, if so, then this got a whole lot more interesting and a whole lot more hopeful. Our next prediction comes on the heels of their failure to cast the deaf-mute spirit out of the boy in Caesarea Philippi. It's chapter 9, starting in verse 30. They went on from there and passed through Galilee. Remember, they were they started they started very, very north, Caesarea Philippi, Mount Hermon passed through Galilee, and he did not want anyone to know, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days he will rise. But they did not understand the saying and were afraid to ask him. Now, after this prediction, they weren't even willing to ask him for an explanation. Safe to say they'd prefer their own fantasies of future greatness as gatekeepers to the presence of Yeshua in the future. You know, well, what's the same here? Okay, since there's still no location, I mean, compared to the first one, there's still no location given, but he uses a familiar biblical idiom for suffering under a divine judgment, namely, being delivered into the hands of men. 2 Samuel 24:13 So Gad came to David and told him and said to him shall 3 years of famine come to you in your land or will you flee 3 months before your foes while they pursue you or shall there be 3 days pestilence in your land now consider and decide what answer I shall return to him who sent me Then David said to God I am in great distress let us fall into the hands of the Lord for his mercy is great but let me not fall into the hands of men. Ezekiel 21, 31. And I will pour out my indignation on you. I will blow upon you with the fire of my wrath, and I will deliver you into the hands of brutish men skillful to destroy. 
Psalm 140, verse 4, Guard me, O Lord, from the hands of the wicked. Preserve me from violent men who have planned to trip up my feet. So there's nothing in the Bible that's more fearful than being delivered into the hands of men because, unlike Yahweh, they will not relent and they will not show mercy. Handing people over to men is what Yahweh did when serious judgment was required, as um, during the time of the judges, over and over again. Uh, and when the northern kingdom was handed over to the Assyrians in 722, and when the southern kingdom was handed over to the Babylonians in 586. Well, before that, actually, that's just when, you know, it was done. So, although nothing is said formally about it in the Bible, it's clear historically that the Jews were handed over to the Romans because of the, the wickedness of the grandsons and great-grandsons of Simon Tassi, who declared themselves kings and were just as, if not more, brutal than the Gentile king they had overthrown, Antiochus Epiphany. So this is not good news. And well, I mean, it is with respect to the gospel, but you know what I mean. Um, it's not good news because there will be no mercy shown, no relenting. This is going to happen and it's going to be ugly. But there's more here. He will be delivered. And delivered in this sense is a language related to actual betrayal. Enemies will just take you, okay? But to be delivered into the hand, into their hands requires someone close to you. Someone among them is going to instigate this. No wonder they didn't want to ask any questions. None of them wanted to be singled out as the cause of their master's downfall. And again, he declares that he will be killed and will rise three days later. That's the common denominator on both predictions, um, death and resurrection, all right? We can also include suffering if we extrapolate from the hands of men saying, which, which is fair to do, given the context. Um, now we're going to cover some new ground, and this account will follow Yeshua's teaching on divorce and his encounter with the rich young man, where the disciples will point out that they've given up everything to follow him, and he will counter that. Following him will come with persecutions in this life and eternal life in the world to come, and we will talk about that next week and the week after. Chapter 10, starting with verse 32. And they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them, and they were amazed. And those following the, who followed were afraid. And taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was to happen to him, saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after three days, he will rise. So... We're almost at the half here, so I'll I'll uh, not go on with my other material. But this is this prediction is entirely different than the others. There isn't even anything more to, when we really read it, and we and we will when we come back. There isn't hardly even anything left to the imagination anymore you know they know they know where and because they know where and they know where they're heading they pretty much know when um all of the chief players are named um everything that's going to happen to him is delineated and even from what he says is going to happen to him we know how he will die eventually so, you know, they're, they're headed on the pilgrim trail up to the feast and it's a time of rejoicing. And, and, you know, they were, they said that there, there's no fasting while the bridegroom is with them. And now they're headed to a feast, but they're probably feeling like they can't eat anymore. And we will be right back.
welcome back to part two of the three passion predictions. It's our special Passover program leapfrogging a couple of the sections of Mark, and these are all the ones from Mark 8, 9, and 10. Anyway, we're going to read that third passion prediction again so I can talk about it. Starting uh, chapter 10, verse 32, and they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. And they were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. And taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was to happen to him, saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after three days he will rise. So this third prediction is a game changer. We have a location now. It's Jerusalem. And they're headed there for the Passover. You know, you can just feel their hearts sink at the news. As I mentioned before, with the on the way references using, using hodos in the Greek, both in the New Testament and the Septuagint, translating the Hebrew derech, we see them on the road using the same language. Yeshua is walking ahead of them. And this is not only positional, but prophetic. They are all going to walk this same way to their deaths. Not in Jerusalem, but all over the world. And I believe that only James, the brother of Yeshua, will die in Jerusalem, but I could be wrong about that. Also, this is the most direct reference to Isaiah 42, 16, where Yahweh says that he will lead his blind people on a way they do not know and will guide them on paths they have not known. So this is new territory, never walked before. This walk of a Messiah going willingly to his death, even though at this precise point, they do not know the exact day. Okay, they know the place. They don't know the exact day. That's really the only thing they don't know at this point, I think. And you're probably aware that you always say going up to Jerusalem, regardless of how you approach it. Even if you were at the top of Mount Everest and leave from there to go to Jerusalem, you are still going to say you are going up to Jerusalem. Down to the base of the mountain, but up to Jerusalem. It's a matter of um, priority and holiness. So the disciples are amazed that he's going boldly, even though he says he will be killed. But it also says that those who followed him are afraid. And that's really interesting. Certainly they knew they were following a miracle worker and they had to be apprehensive as to what was going to happen in Jerusalem. It, it was not unusual for, re or it wasn't unheard of anyway, for, um, rebellions and um, false messiahs to spring up during the Passover season, and that would result in the deaths of innocent bystanders as the Romans cracked down hard on any so-called king who would exalt himself against Caesar and mighty Rome. Rome expected her subjects to be grateful for the peace that they brought to the whole world through their conquests. Yeah. <laughs> and they were paranoid as all get out. Um, and Judea was a problem spot for revolutionaries. The overwhelming majority refused to go along with the Greco-Roman way of life. And although they had leave to live by their own laws, they were considered to be difficult, elitist, and lady, lazy, uh, specifically in reference to their refusing to work on the Sabbath. So he specifically takes aside the twelve which couldn't have been easy considering the fact that they're now traveling with a larger group of Passover pilgrims. And he teaches them about this one last time. So what's detailed here? One, Jerusalem is going to be ground zero for the terrible events he's predicting. Two, the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and scribes. And this is a bit different from the first prediction where it said he would only be rejected by them. But again, we have the language of being delivered over to them. So any hopes that the leadership would be the ones delivering him over to death are now off the table. There would be a more intimate middleman and maybe even one of the twelve. Three, new detail in that the chief priests and scribes will condemn him to death. But as they cannot kill anyone, because their, their right to enact the death penalty had been stripped from them 
fairly recently historically. Um, this would have been likely just as confusing, uh, if not for number four, they would deliver him over to the Gentiles. So the language Yeshua is using here is speaking not just a first betrayal, but also a second. The leadership would also betray him, but their betrayal is worse than the first because for one Jew to turn over another Jew to the Gentiles for punishment was unthinkable and unheard of. I can't even begin to tell you how utterly astounding this accusation would be. They must have been thinking, no one can hate anyone enough to collaborate with the Romans to have them killed. I mean, beside the Herodians. And they weren't really Jews in their eyes, Edomites. So the Romans were so brutal, so merciless, and took such pleasure in inflicting pain and suffering that it can only be described as an outpouring of hatred upon Yeshua for them to resort to it. But then... Yeshua wouldn't have used the term delivered over to the chief priests and scribes unless they were going to show just as little mercy as the Gentiles. 5. The Gentiles will mock him, spit on him, flog him, and kill him. All of these torments were associated specifically with the sentence of crucifixion. Yeshua didn't really have to specify the manner of his ultimate death. Mocking and spitting were all about humiliation, and of course, in the ancient world, loss of honor was far worse than any pain that could possibly be inflicted. <coughs> Crucifixion, you know, the, <coughs> the entire process from arrest to death was designed to utterly destroy a man's good reputation, their memory. Flogging always preceded crucifixion and was a performed front and back, victim absolutely naked, and the pain was so over the top that the victim would defecate and urinate all over himself, either there or on the actual cross. Again, this was about utter humiliation and absolute ruin of a man at all costs. He had to sh be shown to be nothing compared to the power and authority of mighty Rome. 6. After three days he would rise. This, plus the suffering and being killed, are the common features of all three predictions. At this point, they seem to be accepting his death. I mean, after the second passion prediction, they were arguing about who would be his replacement, which is, yes, just as ghoulish as it sounds. This time, um, James and John, a.k.a. the genocide twins, and I call them that because that's what they wanted to do, the Samaritans, are now asking for positions of power in, quote-unquote, his glory, meaning the world to come. So a bit more reality going on in their heads, but still not clear on the concept. And, of course, all this is to prepare them for what is to come. But, as we will see, knowing is not enough. They will be terrified and they'll run. All but the one who betrays him, and I think I see... In the predictions that these revelations and the realization just became too much for Judas, he decided there was only one way to get on top of this situation, and that was to be the one to deliver him over to the leadership in exchange for money. He'd given a lot of his life up, and he wasn't about to walk away empty-handed. Nor was he willing to die along with the others, which would be a logical thing to assume. This rising from the dead stuff must have seemed ridiculous and like the rantings of a madman at this point because despite everything, it would seem that Judas never truly believed in God's ultimate purpose through the Messiah. But that'll come later in the series, just putting a bug in your ear for the moment. So why on earth was it important for him to be handed over not to the Jewish leadership, not only to the Jewish leadership, excuse me, but for them to hand him over to the Romans. Jews and Gentiles united to kill the Messiah so that Psalm 2 could be fulfilled and he could die on behalf of the entire world. Let's read the pertinent verses from Psalm 2 here real quick. Um, Why do the nations, the goyim, rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and their rulers take counsel together against Yahweh and against his anointed Mashiach, saying, let us burst their bonds and let us cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs, Yitzhak. The Lord holds the Yahweh holds them in derision. 
Or no, that's Adonai holds them in derision. Der- derision. Sorry, not Yahweh. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, as for me, um, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. Yahweh said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve, Ebed, Yahweh with fear, and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way. Derech, Horos, in the Septuagint. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Kindled. Blessed are all those who take refuge in him. Okay, although this is seen as a violent psalm, and in some ways it is, I am not inclined to read it in the way that a lot of people preach this. Yes, we see the nations conspiring here with the leaders of the Jews. You know, I believe to throw off the shackles of the Messianic kingdom because it's not compatible with the way things are. Uh, in the case of the Gentiles, or the way things should be in the eyes of the Jewish leaders who want a violent overthrow of the powers that be. But as Psalm 2 tells us, not only are they against the Messiah, but also against Yahweh. You can't be for Yahweh and be against his Messiah. Now, in the first century, most but certainly nowhere close to near all, of the Jewish people, um, maybe 80%, they, they didn't want the Yeshua version of the Messiah. But people would flock to uh, Simon Bar Kokhba a hundred years later because he did fit that violent, revenge-laden profile that would put them on top and in control again. And that's not just them, mind you. That's a common human desire. Be on top. You have the upper hand. But Yahweh is laughing here, Yitzhak, not because he's particularly thrilled, but because no one can stand in his way and he will have his plans come to fruition, even though his own self-appointed, the Pharisees and scribes, self-appointed, and the Roman appointed um, chief priests and Herodians are, you know, in fact, conspiring with the Romans to thwart him, okay? whether they understand it or not. He is moving in wrath, and not only will his wrath be poured out within 40 years on the temple in the city of Jerusalem, but also on the Herodians. But also the Roman Empire will fall because of the uncontrollable influx of faith in Yeshua. You cannot control or intimidate people who are not afraid to die and who will not fight back. They can't ever truly be crushed when you try. You know, the numbers are going to increase when you try and crush people like that. Wrath will also be poured out, whether they like it or not, um, on the, on the powers of sin and death as Yeshua absorbs the worst that they have to offer in terms of injustice and cruelty. And because he's innocent and more than that, the author of life himself, death exhausts itself trying to hold him and has to give him back up again. He is risen because death cannot hold him. This was no magic trick. And through this act, Yahweh declares Yeshua king and sets him on Zion, which is traditionally the space where heaven and earth overlap, but now they overlap in Yeshua. And heaven and earth also overlap on anyone who is Uh, in everyone who is part of his body, you know, which is his temple. Far from a bloody slaughter of the Gentile nations in revenge, this harkens back or actually forward to Isaiah 49, 6, where he says, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you as a light to the nation so that my salvation may reach the ends of the earth. The nations are not doomed to destruction per se, but are become the inheritance and possession of the Messiah. Bad grammar there. Nations, plural, will begin to be obliterated under the banner of the one messianic kingdom that spans all nations and all peoples, Jews and Gentiles as one. 
he shall break down these national barriers in his own body and we become one which is why yahweh laughs because his wrath serves the purpose of restoring eden bringing forth that worldwide community under his king sin and death will meet a violent end beginning at the crucifixion and continuing as the gospel further and further infiltrates the kingdoms of the beast therefore the kings of the earth are commanded to be wise and to embrace the work of the son to kiss him but not as judas did and to embrace the invasion of the kingdom of heaven which has you know which is no longer contained within that small bit of real estate on the temple mount serve him or the larger israel serve him that's garden language fear him that's vassal language as in we're all subjects of the uh great king of the earth and and not powers in our own right and these worldly kings must acknowledge it just as their own subjects acknowledge them they are also called to rejoice you know this is not bad for the kings of the earth this is a cause for rejoicing the world this word gets missed in the mash of seemingly violent and wrathful language you know when we see it as against people and not against powers and principalities and places okay uh, we're commanded to kiss the sun as i already mentioned acknowledge him as god's anointed king lest he be angry yes yeshua can be angry and we perish in the way in the way you know um you know we've been talking about that same language as isaiah 42 16 um and as in the gospels according to how isaiah 42 16 was translated into greek in the septuagint read it again and i will lead the blind in a way that they do not know in paths they have not known i will guide them I will turn the darkness before them into light, the rough places into level ground. These are the things that I do, and I do not forsake them. Why do they need to embrace the sun in the way? Because blind people can't lead themselves along a path they do not know. If a blind person knows the way, they do not need a guide. But if the way's new, they do. All right? This is just, we see this in real life. We all do, okay? Sometimes we put too much stock in our ability to see with our eyes and think that, as Paul says, we are guides to the blind, as it says in uh, Romans 2.18. But the context on that is too much material for the time we have left um, for me to dig into that here. So, back to my question. Why did the Jews and the Gentiles both need to conspire against the messiah why couldn't it be one or the other well because if you are going to die on behalf of the world it has to be everyone represented in your betrayal and murder through their leadership so all the leaders of the jews were represented and the gentiles were represented by mighty rome who considered herself the whole world um you know Jew and Gentile both had to judge him, condemn him, brutalize him, commit gross and utter injustice and destruction against him in order for him to completely gut their right to ever unilaterally condemn anyone a transgressor ever again. Yeshua became king of the world because he proved his supremacy over the world system of injustice and, bru injustice and brutality he fought the beast okay he seemed to have been defeated and then rose again to humiliate and utterly destroy the beast system by removing our need to fear death the beast system no longer has the upper hand despite appearances it can only hurt us in this life but it is powerless in any real way as long as we stand fast the beast stands condemned and, frankly, castrated. <laughs> you know, <laughs> let's, let's go all the way here. Um, now, I got an email. This was a really good question. About my assertion that Yeshua uh, is Yahweh in the flesh. 
in my latest broadcast, and I want to post my answer here. And I realize that it is a confusing issue, and people have different opinions on it because, you know, Scripture rarely, if ever, gives us an ABC or 123 answer to anything where things are easy. Because we're required to be humble about our limitations, to understand and just trust him. And, you know, it's okay to have different opinions, but we have to understand that the Bible is a huge book. And people who say this is how it is often don't understand enough of the Bible to see that there are seemingly conflicting messages. All right. And I say seemingly conflicting because our brains are so small and our experience is so limited that we cannot fully grasp the truth of the reality of God any more than an ant can understand what I'm saying to it. So anyway, here is what I told them. Okay. Well, it, defi it depends on how you define Yahweh in the flesh. And a lot of people bring in a lot of baggage and assumptions into what that means and what other people mean when they say it. Sounds like you think I'm saying that Yahweh in the flesh, me, equals the Father, but I'm not. But God's creative word in the flesh? Absolutely. Can we separate the identity of Yahweh from his word and from his spirit? No. They're one. Echad. Truth is that none of us understand exactly how this works, but we know it works. Deutero, Isaiah, the Psalms, and Yeshua's self-manifesting miracles are very clear, as I've been teaching throughout the series. Yeshua does what only Yahweh can do. Therefore, Yeshua is Yahweh in the flesh. Does that equate him with being the Father? No. I don't know how it works. The truth is that this is never spelled out clearly anywhere how this works. We want to be clear and easy. We need less trust this way. But scripture gives us very little in the way of clear explanations of the deep spiritual matters. This is one of those areas, like what happens between death and the world to come. Not clear. Many different hints, but they all seem to lead in different directions. Do we have to understand? No. We just want to understand. So, is Yeshua Yahweh in the flesh? Absolutely, he has to be. Otherwise, he's just a human and the virgin birth is a lie. And what he did amounts to magic. But Yahweh is spirit and not a physical entity that we can quantify the way I can look at you and say, you're a one of a kind and uh, you seize existing at the limits of your physical body. As complex as we are, we don't even understand ourselves. God gives us ways of trying to grasp his reality, but no definitive answers. I hope that helps. In the end, we have to stop worrying about all this because salvation is a matter of allegiance, not having all the right understandings. And well, that left me with more time at the end than I thought I would have. Um, you know, there... And, and, I want to talk about metaphors. You know, Yahweh really, he's very generous with us because he knows we're just small and pathetic and we're not nearly as small and, or smart and clever as we think we are. We are, in fact, very small. And he gives us these metaphors. And what do we do? We take them way too far. One, we take them out of historical context. And two, we just decide that this isn't just a metaphor that is like, but also unlike, but no, it has to be totally like. And you know, nowhere do we see that as badly as with the bridal sort of language. And I mean, people go crazy with the bride stuff. Oh, warrior bride. Oh, this. Oh, that. You know, and it's it's not in the scriptures. And really, the bridal language is symbolic of the purity that we are supposed to be presented to. Yahweh with it. It's not talking like some people do of an actual physical sort of relationship in the world to come. You know, it, it's, it's wishful thinking. Um, like a lot of times people want Yahweh to be the kind of dad they never had. And, and so we can't take metaphors too, too literally. Anyway, um, see you next week. Have a wonderful Passover.